Welcome back to the Keegan and Company podcast. For those who are new to the show, my name is Keegan Hipgrave. And if you haven't already, could I get you to jump over, give us a little like and subscribe. It's a great way for us to grow the platform and grow the podcast and have some amazing guests like I have today. Uh, In this episode, I'm joined by Premiership winner, from the Hollywood Magpies team, Oleg Markov. How are you, brother? Good, fella. Thanks for having me, mate. Thanks for coming. And like, you pulled out the you pulled out the the medal straight away. Yeah, well, I've been using it as ID for the last month or so. <laughs> I was like, does this get me in? Can I pay for drinks? Well, what's the go? Mate, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> nah, yeah. I um, yeah, I thought I'd share share a bit of the um, the silverware and. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I was saying before, like if if you've read the back, it's um, it's pretty full on and it makes you want to run through a brick wall. But um, yeah, I it's it's yeah, it's a it's a pretty cool memento to to have from such a special day, brother. I'll re- I'll read it out. I'll Go read on. it. I'll, I'll, I'll read it out because I read it out before and I got I got goosebumps. <laughs> um, let me try and have a look. Um, to compete and win on grand final day is every player's dream. As a member of the Premier team, you are now part of history and a culture of the greatest game of all. Congratulations. Pretty cool. Brother, <laughs> that, that is so cool. I, I remember when I when we got him, I was like, you're sort of in the moment and you celebrate and you're having fun. You sort of look at the front, you go, this is really cool. And um, it was probably the first time when we were sort of doing a bit of a lap of honour around the G. Um, I sort of took took a step back from all the fans and walked on the inside um, and I flipped it over and started reading it and I was like, man. I reckon I could play another game of footy right now. <laughs> we got another two quarters in us. Yeah, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm all G'd up now. Mate, how – talk to me. How was the experience, brother? Because I haven't seen you since. Like, I think last time we caught up, uh, we did the Carlton Collywood game just maybe in just before the semis and we had a nice little dinner. We caught up then and I haven't seen you since, bro. So how – mate, how was it? How was the day? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole build-up was, uh, was something I've never experienced. Like, I've I experienced it – sort of in a third party uh, sort of view at, at Richmond. Right. I, um, yeah, I was, I was emergencies for, for many finals and, um, to actually have my first opportunity to play a final was pretty special. Yeah. Um, having seen it so much in front of me, but have, having not had tasted it, mm. um, it was really cool to finally be a part of that experience of, of just finals itself. And then I guess the granny was just, yeah, it was, I sort of reflected on it um, yesterday and I, when, when I mean yesterday, I sort of had a little think about obviously the potty and, yeah. and that and um, I was never really nervous. Like it's really weird to say. In the, in the lead up yeah, to the Yeah, the whole lead up. I, I loved every bit of it. I think I was, re- I was able to um, adjust my fear and, um, and all those sort of negative emotions to excitement and – yeah, it made a whole a whole heap of difference because early in my career, I really struggled with that. Um, and yeah, like this whole year has just been so, I guess from, I know the last day was a granny, but even early in the year, I was a complete different person with um, how I approached training, how I approached games. Um, yeah, I was just super excited. I was, I was extremely grateful and I guess the excitement factor just just snowballed off that. Yeah, because it's a wild week, isn't it? Like you've got um, you've got the day, the days before the big. It's not a party, but it pretty much is like the parade. Uh, the yeah, parade. Yeah. yeah, I remember seeing the photos of like you guys in the cars and you're going down the street and everyone's going mad. Like, mm. and there's a conversation around um, like you've got to lose a grand final to win a grand final because this, the build up can be so overpowering for some. And I look at like in the NRL space, like. The Penrith Panthers, they've won the last three. And I've got a lot of mates in the Broncos team who played in the last grand final. And it's wild. Like they're doing mm. parades, they're doing media, they're getting slammed. And it's almost like it can be too much at some times. But yeah. it looks like you just fully lent into the whole experience. Yeah, I, I I sort of knew being at another club what the pressures were. And obviously the the one was like tickets, yeah. having yeah. people coming out of the woodworks for for tickets, um, family so, members trying to organise You've it. got so many mates now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden everyone's, you know, messaging you. Um, and then I think everyone thinks that you've got this abundance of tickets, like yeah. you're, you've, you've just got them coming out of every, you know, pore of your body. But, um, yeah, they're, they're hard to come by, yeah. e- even for us players. And um, you sort of have to... S- Pick your select few that that can and and can go to the event, but yeah, like the moment 
um, all the parade stuff finished, all the media stuff finished, all the training, you know, like you, you go into training going, oh, like you've still got two main sessions to get through before the game. Like footy is crazy, touch wood, but yeah. like anything can happen. Yeah. Um, so you've sort of, you're, you're going through this quite emotional week as it is. And the, the only day that's normal is the grand final day. Game day. You sort of wake up, you have breakfast, you you go about whatever routine you have. If you've got a superstitional routine, it's the only day that's normal. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just I was looking forward to having a bit of normality. Um, yeah, like I I enjoyed it the whole week itself. It was it was an honour to be a part of. Um, but yeah, I I just prefer the stock standard. Let's just process, get back to work just do our thing. Obviously, you probably don't want to change anything on game day. You want to keep it as routine as possible. Like, what does the morning look like? Pretty cruisy. I mean, we because our days fluctuate between day and night and we, we played a lot of night games, so there's a lot of junk time in the middle and mm. I struggled with night games early in my career because I'm, I'm a big overthinker. Yeah. So, like, me, me thinking about the game used to snowball me into – Stories and, and a, a lot of the time the stories were negative. Yeah. Um, how will I perform? What if this goes wrong? Um, fear of failure, fear of um, my coach's opinions, fear of my friend's opinions. Like all of a sudden when I get to the game, I'm so fatigued. I've yeah. gone – I've played this game through my head for the last four hours. Like, wow. and, and now you're telling me I have to actually go do it yeah. for another two and a half in front of arguably 50, 60,000. Like – I was, it just seemed like a recipe for disaster. Mm. Um, the mornings are easy because you just wake up breakfast, get there, and then you're, you're surrounded by your friends. But I found that my, my only routine is being surrounded by people. Yeah. Um, cause if I'm surrounded by people and I'm having a chat and, and a laugh, I find that I'm not creating stories in my head. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very easy for me to surround myself around people who, um, are like-minded, fun, pretty laid back. And, you know, there's there's certain players within a within a team that love taking it seriously, or they put their headphones on and they, and they get into the game mode. And I wish I could be like that because it looks cool. But <laughs> yeah. I'm not like that. If, no, if, no. if anything, you see me walking around, you know, trying to dance, trying to catch someone's attention, acting inappropriate. I don't know, like giving people wet willies. <laughs> you know? But like that's 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 just how I get comfortable. And yeah. you know, there's there's a select few that are like that at our club, and mm. we just bounce off each other and. In a weird way, it seems unprofessional from, you know, the outset, but for us, that's us being professionals. That's yeah. us preparing the best that we can and making it relaxed. And yeah. It's it's funny like that because I remember growing up, I thought it was the exact same. Like you have to have the headphones on, guys are sitting in the corner, you're not allowed to talk to anyone, you throw them like tennis balls at the wall. And I was like, well, that's the way you got to do it. But if you can take your mind away from the game and like have a laugh, joke around the boys, give the boys a little cuddle or a little wrestle, mm -hmm. like that's same thing for me. Like that was the best way that I could not play the game over and over again. And it sounds like for you, like performance, probably not performance anxiety, but I, I guess a little bit, that's probably the, probably the biggest conversation that so many blokes have gone through before. And we've had that conversation at dinner, however many months ago, like, the chat around performance anxiety and you've yeah. done a lot of work to get to where you are. Can you touch on a little bit about that and, and where that sort of kicked off from? Yeah. Well, I mean, I actually, um, it's sort of funny when, when things don't go your way and you, and you try a lot of things, you get pretty desperate. And, um, I'd like to probably just, um, apologize to a few very important females in my life, my partner and, and my mum, Um, and then, potentially even Sam Kerr being an incredible female athlete in Australia. But um, Emma Murray yeah. is probably the most influential female in sport um, in that genre. And I did a lot of work with her when she was at Richmond. And certain things that I learned and have engraved or instilled in, in my head, God, seven, eight years ago, I still use today wow. with – anchors, um, the way I visualize myself in third person, um, doing like body scans, um, walking after training barefoot, just earthing, grounding myself. Um, yeah, but, but there was a point there where, um, I had anchors, I had all this sort of stuff, but because I was an overthinker, I used to cramp before the game started Wow! and this only happened at AFL. So my first, first year was okay. I, I was pretty naive. I guess my mindset was different. My second year, I probably felt a bit more pressure. Yeah. Um, 
to perform. And is that Richmond? Yeah, when, when I was at Richmond, and um, I end up, yeah, sort of going to the MCG. Used to get taped up, and I used to go, man, my calves are cramping. And the story in my head was, I'm a skinny boy. I'm, you know, I was seventy four kilos at the time, seventy kilos, and um, my one word was to run. And I was like, when your legs start cramping, you go into fight or flight. Mm. For me, I was like, oh gosh, like, um, how am I going to run? I, it's my one word. Like, how am I going to, you know, accelerate, get out of trouble? Like, uh, am I going to cook it at half time? And this is before there was a sub. So yeah. I was like, I have to play the whole game out and I'm going to embarrass myself in front of so many people. Um, Emma sort of got on the front foot and said, look, thank you for being honest. We'll send you to this guy. And I remember driving to this guy's house um, and he sort of said, look, close your eyes, do this and that. And I was very hesitant and I sort of closed my eyes and he goes, just like talk. And the first thing that comes to your head, just say it. And, um, and I started just thinking too much. I, I wanted to give him the right answer, yeah. but out of nowhere, he just goes, no, no, just relax. And before I knew it, I opened my eyes and he had a full word document and I was like, hmm. And he just goes, right, well, here's your formula. Um, when you start getting these feelings of rushing through your legs and, and you feel like you're cramping or you're overthinking, like this is what I want you to vision and have this um, sort of vision towards um, like what you're doing now and, and picture yourself in third person doing this and this and this. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool, cool, cool. And um, so I kind of like got hypnotized. You went to a hypnotist. I think, yeah, but like he was some sort of performance <laughs> yeah. hypnotist anyway. And um, and he gave me a, like a formula and it was it was to do with like uh, visioning, like having sound, uh, uh, like the sound of waves crashing. Yeah. So I could imagine I was at a beach sitting because that sort of relaxed me at the time when, when I was 19, 20. Um, I had, to, I had to pretend I had yellow boots on, like that was a calming color for me. And yeah. like he went through this whole process of step-by-step -step things I had to do and I've used it ever since. And and I don't have to use it as much now. Yeah. Um, but there was a period there where, and it happened when I was at the MCG and Eddie had, when, you're, when your change room's underground, it never happened at VFL because I could see outside yeah. and I was, I was very calm when I could see outside of nature. But when I was inside the MCG or Eddie had underground, I had this urge of like, almost like claustrophobia, like where am I, fear, um, walls are coming in on me. Um, so I just sort of had this little formula where I got essentially hypnotized, yeah. but I'm not sure what happened. Yeah. Um, he worked something out for me and, and it's paid, paid me back in spades. That's so cool. But when you, when you were going through and having this conversation, you said he had like an A4 list of things. Is this things that you said to him? Yeah, the, that, that I sort of don't remember saying. Wow. So I, I vividly remember explaining the first few and he said, calm down. I just remember a few clicks and before I knew it, I just opened my eyes and I was, and after that he goes, did you drive here? And I go, yeah. And he goes, oh, well, like I wouldn't recommend you driving home. And I was like, oh yeah, I kind of feel a bit tired and drowsy in that. And he goes, yeah, well, organize like an Uber or something and yeah. pick up your car another day. And I was yeah. like, oh, look, I'll do that. So that's yeah. like, see, that's so wild. Like the power of the unconscious. Yeah. Mm. And, but like for you, what did, what did like the performance anxiety look like? You talked about like the walls caving in, you talked yeah. about, um, calves cramping. Was there anything else that sort of was a standout for you? Like pl obviously playing the game over in your head? Yeah. I, I, I think that was, that was sort of it. Like the, the, I had a physiological, like I had a chemical reaction where my calves cramped. Like I had, it's bizarre. You do, you know, we, we as athletes do 10 to 12 Ks, um, at training. We, we, we can do some players do 16. I do 12 Ks in a game. I'm, <laughs> I'm not Very that humble, fit. <laughs> Very humble. But, um, yeah, like it, and then all I've done for the day is walk. Yeah. Um, and then like sometimes you get into these superstitions of, before a game, like I'm not going to the shops because mm. I'm going to save every kilometer I can, yeah. every step I can, I'm going to save. And like, that's a really negative way, one, to live your life. Yeah. You're pretty placid all day. Um, and it doesn't really affect w what you're going to do that afternoon yeah. by just going to the shops. But I was cramping. Like that's, to me, that was so far-fetched and beyond my imagination. Like I would prefer negative stories. Yeah. But I had negative stories that were leading to this chemical reaction in my body that was physiologically making my calves tighten. Yeah. And before I knew it, they were so tight. When I got to the game, I was so nervous that they just 
Is that a cramp? Like, it's just bizarre. But props to you for knowing that and recognizing that and actually reaching out to Emma. Is that how it worked? You reached out to Emma? Yeah. Well, I mean, it took it took me a while. It took me about four or five games to finally figure, figure out something wasn't right. Yeah. Um, and again, it was probably, it's the ego as well that stops you. Like, mm. you don't want to think anything's wrong with yourself or an individual. And um, yeah, I... I initially thought that this this may sound ridiculous, but I just need to get it out because it's not enjoyable. Yeah. And I think that was the thing for, for me, the hardest thing in my eyes, and this goes to whether I'm with a partner or, for instance, at the moment, Becky um, or my family or anyone, the hardest thing for me initially is to start talking. Really? Um, I struggle with the, the thought of um, what other people might think or, um, you know, like my, my, my biggest – attribute is wanting to have fun or I'm, I'm an empathetic, sympathetic person, empathetic, sympath- yeah. And, um, and I, I always just want to have fun. So I feel like whenever I have a burden, I don't want to talk to someone about it because it's taken away the fun element mm. of our relationship. Yeah. And I don't want them to think, oh, why do I have to deal with this? What, like, if you know what I mean? Like mm. for me, the, the one thing I always wanted to be is fun. But then I realized that when, when I'm, when I'm holding on to a burn, I'm not as fun as I should be. Yep. I'm not the person I, that I want to ideally be. Um, so, yeah, I guess for me, reaching out was the hardest. But once I got it out and you you realize that people around you are like safety nets, mm. people that really care about you and want the best for you. And at this, at this time, it was Emma Murray. She just knew, right, let's get on top of this. Thank you for coming to me. And it was just like, right, let's try this, this, this. And she goes, it might not work the week one. Might not work week two. Might take eight weeks. Might take a year. But we'll get on top of this. Like it, and and the moment it get like once once we get on top of it, you will start enjoying your footy again. But like I said, props to you because there would be so many blokes who wouldn't speak up about it. Like that's why I love that you're getting involved with Movember, right? Like because mm-hmm. they're so much about speaking about things, especially in the AFL, NRL, professional male professional sport. We're like big macho tough men that don't want to talk about our feelings and I feel like it's changing and for you just to be so open and honest and even like having the awareness and like I guess self-awareness to be like nah this is actually something that I want to work on because I'm going to be better off for it Mm. and like I think that when I was having this conversation with Kalen Ponga he won um Dallium last year in, in the NRL and he's like vulnerability is like a superpower it's like vulnerability makes me be closer with my mates because when I'm vulnerable with someone, they're more likely to be vulnerable back with me and the connection is so much better and that means like the boys are closer and therefore we're playing better footy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's something we we drove at at Richmond and it's something that is considered in high regard uh, where I'm at now at Collingwood. Um, But I just remembered when when you see your leaders be vulnerable, that's when you go, all right, the people that you see as superheroes, your, your captains, your coaches, and when they're being open and vulnerable to you and um, explaining their, their story and their feelings, and you go, wow, you're relatable, but also like you're not invincible. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, it brings so many people closer. And I just think the brotherhood that are, that we've created both at, at Richmond and um, obviously what we're creating now is so, so similar. Um, and obviously the, the outcome – speaks for itself what we've been able to achieve but all in all the stories and the connections that we've created over the over the last eight years is something that I'll forever keep close to me and dear to me. Is there any specific times at Richmond or at Collywood whether it being a a session whether it being an activity a workshop that brought you guys closer together or was there a time that you guys are all sitting down you're like this person was this person was able to talk about it, or was there a specific example that that you that stands out? Um, it's pretty well documented. At, at Richmond, we had a thing called the Triple H, and yeah. it's not the guy that puts water in his mouth and sticks yeah. it in the air and <laughs> yeah. fights yeah. people. It, um, it was about your your hero, your hardship, and your highlight. And um, yeah, that that was it, that was a pretty pretty cool experience to be a part of with with so many um, so many of your teammates. We yeah, you sort of you get prompted by your coach. He goes, would, "Would you want to share those three H's? Yeah. You, you triple H. One person every week. We we, it- we we probably did two or three in a session, and we called it the Richmond Man. And and um, 
we started off with obviously the the coach and and the captain and they sort of led the way and seeing them talk about the imperfections and wanting to be better and mm. um it, like it the the stories that people were able to then tell like you realize you're an individual I'm an individual but what we're going through is completely different and we're on our our own journeys but we're in the same environment mm. and um I think that was the one time that I realized like, wow, like there's more beyond just kicking, catching a ball. Yeah. Like we're all going through something incredible. And, um, yeah, I feel like that was one of the main things that we did at Richmond that will forever stick in my heart as being like the things that, that hit home for me. Um, and that was led by a guy called Shane McCurry, who's an incredible person. And he used to have workshops once a week and we, and we'll do team bonding activities once a week, which was I feel like a lot of the boys didn't like it, but me being the type of person I am, it was like, right, we'll, we'll get in a conga line and we'll, and we'll go through the um, the admin. So we used to like conga, 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 conga. And, like, and at, at the time he felt silly, but it was hard enough to dance and do things like that. Yeah. But um, it was fun to just do it with your mates. Yeah. And um, the, the other thing we that we did that I really enjoyed was um, was we, we, we just stared at each other for like a minute. Yeah, and you just stare at a person, and um, it's crazy to think that just staring, not saying a word, how powerful that can be. And what do you mean? So there was an artist, and I just remember the song vividly. It goes like, "Ole ole o, ole ole o," and <laughs> it's just be- in the background. You got a beautiful voice, bro. Thank you. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but so so there was an artist. Uh, I'm, I'm going to completely butcher this, but she might have been Scandinavian or, or European of some of some descent. And um, she set up a little table in a workshop where she sat across from someone and mm. just stared at him. Mm. And um, no music, no nothing, just just stare. And you stare at each other for, for a minute or two minutes and it gets pretty powerful because like you're probably saying something internally in your head the other person probably saying something internally in their head and um and it's it gets really powerful like i i don't know really how to explain it. you sort of just got to try it one day but yeah. um we 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 once did that and i remember with a few of the boys it's like yeah you sort of sit there and you try not to laugh with a few because like that's just the kind of relationship you might have but then there were times when and i remember looking to grimesy and um he was someone who i looked up to a lot and i'd like sort of like nearly tearing up. I wow. was like, I was like, I don't know why just looking at you makes me feel like emotional and like in a good way. Like I felt like I was very um, grateful and and appreciative of the friendship we had and he's done so much for me um, that I was like just staring at him and I was like, oh gosh, please hold these tears back. And just like it just, I don't know, just something within our gaze of each other looked yeah. The way it did. Um, do, you but, have, yeah. do you have conversations about it afterwards, like what you were thinking about or, or where your head goes afterwards? Um, yeah, like I, f- I feel like so. So what we did was we we had a um, – there was probably six of us on each end and then um, once the sort of two minutes were up, we sort of moved to the next person. We sort of thanked each other and hugged or um, handshake and we moved on to the next person and um, we sort of did that for 10 minutes. And, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty cool. I feel like if you were to – to follow up, it, it's a good way to to sort of go. Hey, like, what were you thinking? Yeah. What um? Uh, yeah, I probably haven't actually. I guess I was twenty years old when when I did it with Grime, but it would be cool to really finally good. reach out and actually go. Hey, like, because it was such a it was such an important piece to us building each other and and ourselves internally. So just on that, how good are fucking men on men hugs? Mate on mate, like I see you this morning, and you don't even come in for the handshake. You're just full open arms, brother. It's, it's, it's a little slap, it's and a, then there, there, there's <laughs> something so special and so lovely about yeah. just two grown men just fucking hugging it out, yeah. and not even like just a quick hug, just like an embracing, embracing. Hug. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I um, I'm, I'm big on I'm like on the footy field. I'm very very touchy. Yeah. Um, I feel like people already know that. I love high fives. I love – I always go into games going, I'm going to give out the most high fives today. Like, who's going to stop me? Who's yeah. going to match me? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be the happiest. I'm going to celebrate everything my mates do. I'm going to get to people. I'm going to give them a high five. I'm going to celebrate all the little things and um, love my hugs. Before the grand final, I remember sitting down and and like the the old traditional, like, all right, we're going to put our – 
Well, yeah, hands yeah, on her yeah, knees. Yeah. And I remember like looking over going, this sucks. I was like, hey, boys, everything's good. Like grab, <laughs> grab them by the hand. Yeah. Lolly down and smiled. Because um, that was the photo. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, it got sent to me. And I didn't realize I was going to use that. I, I sort of did initially the first few photos like normally. And then um, at the very end, I just went, boys, it's good. Like, and then, um, but that probably just sort of speaks as to how I am around the club. Like boys are trying to get treatment and massages and I'm in there like hugging them, tickling them. Like I try and get under like, you know, when you're in the massage, you're in a little hole. I'm trying to get as close <laughs> as I can to them and see who flinches first. Like, so yeah, I'm sure the physios hate me, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm a very, very sort of around the club. I'm a very sort of touchy feely, um, huggy sort of person. And I hope it does show because um, I, I get, I get a lot of messages from older men or, or older, older men actually stop me on the street. Sometimes it goes, Hey, look, I haven't enjoyed footy much, but I love the energy you bring and, yeah. um, you make me want to watch footy again. And it's, it's a pretty cool compliment to receive knowing that these men probably grew up in a, in an era that was mm. old school. You get her, rub a bit of dirt in it, yeah. um, no emotion, you can't be upset. Um, and to, to, to be almost a bit of a, of a front runner. And, and it's not like I'm trying to do that either. It's, it's my authentic self and it comes so easily and naturally to me. But um, yeah, to actually know that you're doing good in in a world that can be dark at times is is an incredible feeling. But it fully changes the conversation of those old boys, especially like older players from when we started. Because what are you, 26? 27, yeah, 27 I'm getting now. old. But that's what I mean when you, when <laughs> we, because we're very similar ages, when we came through into the professional sporting scene, it was a little bit like that, but being able to change that conversation with the older gen, like that must be so special. And like you said, it's fully your authentic self. Like yeah. you're not putting a front on for anyone. Like I remember when I came into grade, I was so like nervous to to talk. Like I think for the first year, I probably mm. didn't even say a word because these are guys who you look up to. You know, I think yeah. Corey Parker, who was the captain at the Brisbane Broncos at the time when I, where I was, he um he was 18 when he made his debut and I was two years old. Like I was like, you know, I was like your wow. kid. So these are kids who you look up to from when you're a kid. Yeah. So obviously you're not saying much, you know, you're definitely not giving them a hug and getting under no, the, yeah, and yeah. getting under the massage table. Wait, sorry, I'm going to take this off. I feel like a bit of a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a fraud wearing this. Um, bomb it, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's the thing. And like, we did you ever struggle with that coming through? Because I look at you now as obviously someone who's so kind, who's so like warm and like people just feel comfortable around you. Like we, we linked up, obviously know Becky really well, who's sitting behind the, um, who's sitting behind the, the mirror. <laughs> yeah, she's waving. Um, but I know Becky, Becky really well, but we connected this year and mate, I've got so much love for you now, just purely because you make everyone feel so comfortable around you. But did you, when you came into the AFL scene, did you ever have those thoughts of like, I don't know, not being good enough, but I guess like a little bit quiet or not being your true authentic self? Um, well, I, I guess it, it is that vulnerable piece of, um, of, I don't know, just opening up your walls or, yeah, like in 2016, that was the first year I was at Richmond. It wasn't a, it wasn't an awfully good year with performance. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like it, it was probably hard to, I feel like I did come in in an authentic manner. Yeah. Um, I guess people that knew me from North Adelaide, like I, I used to come in to games wearing fluoro green jeans, like big purple high tops. And I used to longboard to like my games. And, um, and this is me as like a 16 year old. And then I had my motorbike and I was rolling into like games on a motorbike, like to under 18 games. And I was like, who the hell is this bloke? And I was just some skinny fella. I had this ridiculous hair. Oh, I've got to show you this this mohawk I was once running because we'll get we'll find a photo of oh, it. We'll clip it up. Yeah. It was like I had this mohawk, but then I like had a slit that went from the front and wrapped around my head, like. <laughs> and I thought I was the coolest thing yeah, ever. But yeah. I, I guess I've I've always been in a way authentic. Um, I've been I've all, I've enjoyed being a bit different. Like have a look at my moustache. Like it's Beautiful I'm 27 and I'm walking around the streets like this. I went to Baker's Delight today and <laughs> had about 40 people stare at me, going, "What the hell is this?" But um. Yeah, like I, I find that um, I try not to put on a persona and um, Alan Watts used to talk about persona and he's a philosopher um, who's passed away. But persona, um, the Latin version or the Latin words when you break it down, per meaning mask, 
and sonar is like sonar sound. So it's mass sound. And um, his his vision of it was to do with, one, the acting and amphitheatre of it. So the reason it's persona and you, the mass sound was back in the day, I'm guessing back in Shakespeare times when they had like an amphitheatre, that was the cinemas back then and that was considered movies and plays and, and that. And um, that's where actors first came alive. Mm. Um, so to sometimes when the amphitheatres weren't or were packed, the actors used to wear these masks that had like little megaphones on them, like tubes, and that, that was called their persona so that they can reach the the deeper audience. Um, and the way Alan Watts used to talk about it was the moment you sort of come off the stage, um, you're greeted by your friends, your family, they give you champagne, they celebrate um, your performance, they go, wow, you did so well, like um, you should be really proud of yourself. Alan Watts used to sort of go, hey, look, that should be like your life. When, when you go backstage and your friends and family come with the champagne, that should be like your funeral. How would you want them to perceive your acting career or the career you've just had, your life? And um, would you want to act someone that you're not or would you want to be your authentic self? So he used to talk about the persona being, do you want that mask on or do you want it sort of off? Mm. Um, because regardless, your friends and family are going to go backstage and they're going to celebrate you for you. And, um, yeah, I guess, and I, I sort of, I sort of tried to, I know that's the philosophical version of it. Um, thank you, Alan Watts, for making me sound wise. And, sound and so wise, but I, I'm not that wise. Um, <laughs> I, I tried to sort of dumb it down this year and, and I said to someone, or I might have said in an interview, I'm not Tom Cruise. And I guess w w what I was saying by that was, you know, actors get paid millions, if not billions of dollars to act. Um, if you're going to do that in, in your workplace and get paid essentially minimal wage or just a normal regular wage, what's the point of acting every day? Yeah. It's tough. It's it's exhausting. It's draining. Um, it's so easy to be your authentic self, but at the same time, you probably do need the environment. Um, you need friends and family that can support and help you. Um, as in like when you do become your authentic self and you want to put that out there, it is, you, you don't want to get rejected. Yeah. The moment you get rejected is when you then put the mask back on, you put a persona on, you you either become tough or you, you know, like to break all that, you, you need to be in the environment where friends and family can, can catch you in a safety net and go, Hey, yeah. like, this is you, like, this is be you and keep when, growing and keep blossoming as you. And when you're being your true authentic self, you're probably going to find people gravitate to you, gravitate towards the people. And you're probably more likely to be yourself anyway around those people. And those people are going to reciprocate that back. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Have yeah. you heard, um, have you read that book or heard of that book, the five regrets of the dying? No, by Ronnie Weaver. No. So cool. This lady, she was like a nurse for elderly people and she worked with a bunch of like, I don't know how so many like elderly people in like the last stages of their life. And what she found was there was five common themes that I guess she she found throughout those people. And one of them was not living an authentic life. Like on like on their deathbed, they would be like one of the biggest regrets that they would talk about is not living their true authentic self, you know, yeah. which was so cool to see. And she, and she obviously worked with so many people, but that's such a great thing to take away in our everyday life, like yeah. being your true authentic self and how like freeing and how like not spending so much like energy on acting and yeah. putting a face on. Like, and I think that's, that's so cool and that's so refreshing. Is there any, like, I look at it, like, is there any tips that you could give, I don't know, I guess younger crew coming through to do that? Like you talked about having, like, a good family and good support network around yeah. them. I, I, I think the environment's key. Yeah, um, yeah like, so, sorry to bring Alan Watts back into this. I love <laughs> him as a fly. I used to, I've read all of his books and I love the way he sort of thinks about life. But um, the the – and I'm going to completely butcher this, but I remember reading in a book and it's, it sticks out to me because I probably relate to it a fair bit, but um, he spoke about um, when he talks about the, your environment and how you're connected to your environment and um, he spoke about like blood and he goes, when blood's in your body, it's flowing, it's got a purpose, it's moving oxygen around, it's got hemoglobin going through it, like it's pumping through your heart and all of a sudden it's in this flow state and it's 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 incredible. It's part of a, a bigger thing, this big colony, and it's just like it's got all this stuff it's meant to do. Um, but you take that exact same blood and you extract it and you put it in a test tube, that blood 
has a purpose, but its purpose is to be tested. Mm. It's waiting. It's stale, stagnant. And it's like that's the same blood that once was flying around your body. Mm. It's like once you get something that isn't in its correct environment and habitat, it changes its whole perspective. It's the means of it, the way it moves, the way it flows. And um, I guess he he spoke a lot about it being the same with life. The, the easiest way to, it probably gets a bit dark, but the easiest way to sort of kill a person or kill a man is by taking him out of his natural habitat mm. and putting him somewhere he's not meant to be, like like a human in Alaska with with no materials. Like he's not going to survive very long, but that's a essentially a quick death. Like I, I reckon, you know, I'm pretty good at camping, but I reckon I would <laughs> last. The troopy, yeah. yeah, I'd last maybe maybe four hours in Alaska, yeah, yeah, but yeah. by myself. But um, but he he's, he also then said like an easy and uh, an, an easier but longer way to do the mm-hmm. same thing is by putting a man or a woman or a human in a environment where um, they're going to struggle for a long period of time and they're just going to depreciate slowly. They're going to be unhappy for longer. And I look at you in the Collywood environment as someone who's thriving. Like yeah. you look like you look so happy where you are now. And I was talking to Becky about this yesterday about just how, like you're a happy dude. Like don't get me wrong. And, you're, and I think anyone who knows you well knows that you're a very happy guy and a very kind guy. But just you in the environment it's just, it's so cool to see. And I know you do a lot of media with the Collywood media, but that's the way you are. Like mm-hmm. the like those little clips that Collywood put out of like, I know you're talking about the boys tattoos or the game day <laughs> stuff or, or whatever it is. Everyone, I imagine the fans and, and people who enjoy the game, they would enjoy seeing that like because it's yeah. fun. It's, a, it's feel good content, but that's just you being you. And I look at you like having so much fun in the Collywood environment. Is that, is that a culture that I think like fit to you? Like, is that environment fit to you the way you want to be? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, when, when, when we sat down with Fly, and I obviously knew Fly from, um, from being at Richmond and I knew the type of person he, he was and what he promoted. And I guess his morals and his values, um, and having someone who has family, has fun, hard work is always going to be there. Yeah. Um, I feel like you, you weed out people that don't want to work hard pretty quickly. And I was always one who worked hard, but I loved having fun while doing it. Like whenever, whenever we're running and times get tough in preseason, I'll be the one who's yelling out just stupid stuff to get the boys through yeah. just because I'm like, I'm hurting too. But like, like what, what are you saying? To like me? I'd like everyone's in preseason, but I'll be like, Boys, no one else is doing this. Yeah. And then I like roll in like the David Goggins, like, yeah. they don't know me, son. Yeah. Who's going to carry the boat? Who's going to carry the boat? And I'm so fatigued and no one's laughing, but I'm like, it, it's surely cheering someone up. Like yeah. someone's getting through because I'm just having, having a bit of a laugh. And, um, yeah, you sort of do your cliches like, um, like what are they, like hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard and yeah. like, and we're like – five sets into our one Kers and like boys like shut up and I'm like no 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 like come on like give me something back you need those you need those boys around the club yeah because they're like mate preseason is tough Tough, and then everyone's going through it and you look at the success that you guys had especially in the grand final man like tell me tell me about that experience like that would have to be so incredible and so foreign to have like that winning feeling yeah yeah, like I mean, I've I was I played in a losing VFL grand final, and then we won a VFL grand final, and um, to have seen a few grand finals happen in front of me, I, I think I lived a little bit in like I wouldn't say regret, but I was very envious of what I saw. Like I was always I loved seeing my friends succeed in that, but when when you see them succeed over and over at a at your childhood dream. Yeah. Like it, it did in a way eat away at me a bit. So I think that's why the move had to sort of be made when I moved to the Gold Coast. I just needed a fresh start and power of change. But I guess like going full 180 and being able to experience not only the week but the grand final and um, it's sort of funny this year, every time um, I've been under pressure or I've had elements where – I would have capitulated in previous years with fear of failure or something gets a bit tough and I like turn into a marshmallow. Mm. This year I've been so excited and thrived that occasion. Um, 
something I've never, and I, maybe it's the work I've done with Emma Murray and how in tune I was, but I, I'm a very, like I said before, empathetic person, sympathy. Like I, I struggle to see friends get hurt or um, I can put myself in other people's shoes. And um, But when I was on the footy field, I felt like I was a psychopath, like I was a doctor. Like I was just so task orientated. I was just knew what I had to do. Um, and when times got tough there, I felt like we – grew closer, mm. especially as a backline, because as a backline, our margins for error, like if if a forward was to slip over, um, it's not a goal. Like they've still got to get through the whole team. Mm. But if we slip over and it's a goal against us, all of a sudden the whole crowd is like, oh, you should have kept your feet. You should have done this. Like it's yeah. just our risk is bigger and greater than most other positions. Um, so I felt like when the grand final was put in the pressure cooker, and the grand final was so fun to be a part of, like yeah. to to go out and battle with 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 your best mates and um to to have such a game that was full of momentum swings and to be a part of that and it was a genuine arm wrestle. Yeah. It was. I'm glad I was on the field because I haven't watched the game back and I don't think I will. Yeah. I got stuck on the bench for a period and I wanted to throw up. That's really? how sick I felt because yeah. I felt helpless. Yeah. When you're actually on the field, you've got some form of control. Um, that was the most enjoyable part. And when it was going back and forth and it was within a goal and that was probably the most alive I felt and the most enjoyable, I f- like in, like the most fulfillment and enjoyment I had. Um, and it's probably something that if, if I was in a grand final, probably four years ago or three years ago, even potentially two years ago, I would have capitulated for sure. Yeah, really. But th- this is the first time. And I don't know whether it's me growing as an individual or whether it's the people I have around me to help support me and that everyone was a special cog and everyone just knew what to do. And maybe it's potentially the, the people I had around me who were able to allow me to, to feel calm and go about my job knowing that they I trust them. Mm. So yeah, the the day itself was was one I'll forever remember um through the whole battle. But then also sort of when the siren went, the siren was was hectic. I um I've never felt anything like it. And I, I guess I guess sort of reflecting on it, I just remember when the siren went, so uh, I guess the moments before that it was, um, I was, I was a high back and I was trickling up the middle. Will Hoskin Elliott kicks the ball forward and Pendlebury and myself were in the sort of middle and we're patrolling sort of the middle. And I remember he turns around and tells me to stop and hold. And because at this point you sort of just like adrenaline, I was just running up the field. Mm. So I stopped and I waited. Stuff happened for a few seconds. And the moment the siren went, I saw a lot of the opposition fall um, I felt like they fell forward as well. That, that was an observation I think I saw. All the people I did see, they fell forward. We had a handful of us fall back and I just saw the wave of our supporters stand and then they had like their arms up and it was one of the biggest roars I've heard. And then I like, look over and it, I think it took me about two seconds to process that it was done. I looked over and I saw Jeremy House sprinting at me. And he's flying. And I remember like looking at him going, all right, I'm going for you too. So I started sprinting at him. And there's a slow-mo, and I think it might be on my social media, but where Nick Dacos and um, Tom Mitchell, they fall back. At the very end, you can see myself running in slow motion. But then as you see me running, you see me like slow down because I was running at Howie, but he was flying at me. And I just remember going, you're not stopping. And I was like, I'm like... 80, 80 kilos, you're like 90. So I was just like, whoa. And you see me brace and he's just cleaned me up. <laughs> so much love. Yeah. And I just remember we just like yelled at the ground, we're hugging each other. I, I got to certain players and I just I just started bawling my eyes out. I actually can't remember why, what I went. I had this feeling of relief and relief is such an addictive feeling because I felt light. Mm. Nothing was on my shoulders. Like I, I honestly felt nothing right now is going to hurt affect me like no, I just felt invincible for us I just had this relief I was like whoa that's it like we did it like it's it's done and I just stood there and 
I, I'm not sure whether I started reflecting subconsciously because my conscious mind did not exist. Mm. I was not planning anything. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't, I wasn't sure where, where Becky was. I, I had not like, I just was hugging people. And I just remember people were talking to me saying, what a journey well done. And like people were just saying things to me, but I was just staring off into the grandstand, just like up. My eyes were always up. I remember that I was staring up at the sky. I didn't look anyone in the eye. I just was like, what the hell? Like I was just, I was in like, you euph- like in this euphoric state. Um, just like taking it all in. But yeah, but I wasn't sure what I was taking because consciously I didn't exist. Like I just, there was no me going, where's Becky? I need to see the coach. I need to, like there was no, I I had that moment where I said, I need to shake everyone's hand. So I went into the opposition and shook all their hands. And, um, and then once I sort of got back into this, like, I was just like going with the flow. I was in this la-la land of just like, and I was just hugging people, people running up to me. And I was just like, I was honestly like with the fairies, I've never felt anything like it. And it lasted until we, we sort of had the the medal ceremony. And that was the moment when I was like, right, I'm going to um, make a conscious effort to to look after the little the little kid, make sure I give him my attention. And um, it's his moment as much as it is mine. And um yeah, I just remember going, um, shake his hand, ask him what his name was, knuckles him, and um, yeah, and then I said like that was that was sort of it. That's when I had the the physical copy of the medal. That was yeah, that was and really that, really and cool. It's absolutely beautiful as well. It's quite heavy too, yeah. but yeah, it just it having seen a few of them, but never been able to wear one yourself. And I know, I know, there's probably so there's always stories about. Um, how many should be given out and and that and I completely agree there should be more given out to the playing group. Mm-hmm. Um but again, like that's really cool to have and I didn't stop wearing it for four or five days yeah. post the granny. Like I was going to bed in it, I was sitting in the spa with it, I was wearing it everywhere. Like but now it's it sort of gets put in a closet in, in my room. It, it gets put nice and safely. I sometimes give it to mum and dad just so they can look after it because I don't want it really at my house. Mm. Their house is a bit more secure. And um, But the things I remember the most are the stories and, um, you know, and I, I guess that is sort of the, the physical copy of um, sort of a bit of my journey. But a lot of it comes from your friends and your loved ones and, um yeah, I, I guess as well, sort of post that you, you always reflect. And I had so many parents, especially, they messaged me um, after the grand final or they stopped me on the street and they go, hey, like, your story's so incredible because it was never give up. It was about resilience. It um, You motivate my son and, and my kids look up to you. And, like, that's really cool to have those um, conversations with parents and knowing that you're changing the life of um, potentially kids that are growing up through a time that's probably trying to make you fail Mm -hmm. with social media. They're trying to grab your attention. Companies are trying to essentially make you fail. Um, But it wasn't like that isn't just me. Like within my four walls, I gave up on myself. Um, There was a moment there where times really, really, really got dark and tough for me Um, and the people that, probably did get me over the line was my partner and, and her father. So like Becky and Scotty were the two people that um, I guess when I lost all confidence and all belief in myself and essentially I was unemployed and I didn't want to open myself up and be vulnerable to uh, 44 new guys and staff members, I, um, yeah, I, I, I completely gave up on my dreams, myself, everything. And people see the end result, mm. physical copy, and and they and they see my name and they see me in the paper or whatever it is. But within my four walls, it wasn't me. And this is and this is what I want to touch on. Like I look at the medal, I look at the success you have, and I think for you and everyone that knows you, no one deserves the success probably more than you, brother. I think everyone, everyone that I talk to that knows you knows you well. They're like. If there's one person that deserves a grand final win, it's it's you. And it's purely because the love you give out. And that medal symbolizes not just obviously the win, but the last 10, 15, 20 years of hard work that you've had to go through, all the resilience and all the struggles that you've gone through. And that's probably something that I want to touch on. You know, you you talked about it briefly before. 
I probably want to like rewind back to back to the start and when you were you were talking about falling out of love in love with the game and and where you were at. Um, is there a starting point that that you can that you can pinpoint where, um, when when you were when you were going through these these conversations and probably the experience back on the Gold Coast or, or when yeah. you were starting to fall out of in love with the game? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I mean, I, I won't obviously touch base on the events and course, yeah. uh, essentially what sort of happened um, dot to dot, but there are definitely feelings and emotions that I had connected to a certain time in my life. And um, yeah, I guess sort of 18 months ago was was when it sort of the back end of my first year at the Suns and um, I just, I had never had soft tissue before and I had maybe four or five and four, I had the like a TFL, I had a calf, came back in the first quarter against Brisbane in a Q clash and did my hammy in the first five minutes. And then I had a, a calf that came back and I just couldn't get in control of my body. Yeah. I, and as athletes, the one thing you want working is your body. 100%. Like when, when you're one mode of transport that you rely on that either pays your bills, gives you a satisfaction of happiness, um, gives you fulfillment or purpose when that stops working and you don't know why, like that's when things started going south for me. And, um, I was probably touted as very unprofessional, um, okay. which I, I didn't enjoy that because I feel like professionalism is subjective to how people deem it and see it. Um, you know, like we, I look at our club now and there's certain boys that are older that their professionalism is to have a day off or, spend time with their kids. Other people, it's like, yeah, I'll get to work because that's what makes me better. And other people play golf. Like it's just professionalism shouldn't be always carrying a diary, writing, everything being so diligent, having superstition. Like that's, it works for some people. And I guess the analogy as well for that is like the old, <laughs> it's another Alan Watts thing. It's the, it's the monkey who saved the fish from drowning by putting him safely up a tree. Um, you know, the monkey obviously doing something that he'd know works for him, being safe in a tree, thinking it would work for everyone. So he tries to save the fish, but all it does is drown, it suffocates the fish. fish. Yeah. And I, I just, I just found that I, I wish the people that once saw and had called me unprofessional had seen what I'd done this year. Um, and if anything along their lines and, um, I would have been the most unprofessional player yeah. in their in, the, in history, <laughs> but um, yeah. I guess I guess I just found the formula that worked for me. And um, with Collingwood, that was the one thing that they uh, even even before I got the contract, um, they we we put myself in in the gym, and the guys said to me, "Look, notice how there's no coaches in here." And I go, "Yeah, there isn't any." And they go, "But we love your character. We want you around the club. What's going to get your contract?" Let's find the best formula for you so that you can perform the best you can on the grass because that's where you're going to get the contract, out on the field. And I remember that was just things I was preaching for so long, but to have people say that and actually put it to work like that. Validate it and reinforce it. Yeah, yeah. and we made a plan for it and because there was a point there and at, 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 at Gold Coast where I, I really, really did struggle. Um, and I, 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 it turned into a thing where I had 20, 25 minutes to drive home from work and most afternoons. And I don't know why I felt the way I did at the time. And, you know, it's obviously I've got my side of the story and other people got theirs, but at the same time, I probably could have done a lot of things differently. And, um, but I'm sort of glad I didn't because it's aligned me and put me on a certain journey that I have been put on. Um, but I learned a lot about myself during that time. But those car rides were tough on the way home because being an overthinker and yeah. um, you'd always go to, towards the negative and 20, 20 to 25 minutes by yourself when you've had a shit day at work. Um, yeah, I used to probably every second, third time I drive home, I'd, I'd tear up in my car and and yeah, fuck, I've had some meltdowns. Um, yeah, I was going to say, what does, what does like struggling in like dark times look like, like look like for you? Where does your um, head go? Help. Like it goes, it goes, I feel alone. Um, I feel 
yeah, like, whoo, whoo. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I get so zapped of energy. Um, you, you definitely feel like that's it. Like, yeah, you're just by yourself. Nothing's going to help it. Um, you're going through solutions in your head. Um, I guess, uh, sorry. Um, I guess everything you sort of try to make do and make better when it doesn't work and you don't know where the problem is, that's the hardest part because you start feeling helpless um, and it's a shit feeling to feel helpless. I sort of knew there was a leak in the kitchen but I couldn't find it um, and I just felt like the kitchen was flooding and I was just grabbing tools like hammers and smacking things. Um, it started probably creeping into just, you know, like I'd come home and they could go, do you want to go to the beach? It's like you've lived on the Gold Coast, 25 degree day, beautiful day. And I was just like, I don't want to go. I don't want to leave the house. I don't mm. just leave me. I was so exhausted and fatigued by negative stories and um, just trying to find solutions to things that I didn't know, like what was going on. And to this probably day, I don't know what was wrong. I just had to essentially change my environment or make change. And um, I guess in 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 the in probably those dark times where I was trying to find things and I, I went through avenues of trying to f- feel better, like, you know, people resort to all sorts of alcohol, whatever it may be, or porn. Um, they were just temporary Band-Aids. Um, but the, the, the one person that was a bit of a shining... Shining light for me at the time was um, Reece Shaw. Uh, he he was someone who I'd message all the time. Mm. Our last conversations have just would be, mate, I can't get through training this afternoon. Like I, I'm going to struggle. I've got no energy. And I don't know whether he knew that he was doing like the right thing, but at the time I think all I needed was someone just to take my mind off it Yeah, because that's how I sort of operate at times um, while I try to figure things through. And he used to just go, coffee, let's go. And he would grab me, would talk about Formula One all the time, would make like all sorts of crude jokes. Like he was just, he was an incredible person that I think I was able to probably play an extra eight games that year just because he solely used to pick me up and hold me up. Um, he made he made football enjoyable for me at a time when I probably did struggle. Um yeah, I see it really emotional during games. I I broke my face in the last game and I remember crying, but my partner, she brought her friends with and her brother and that with like a beautiful sign and um yeah, that was pretty cool. Nice. Um yeah, that sort of made me tear up a bit. Um <laughs> but yeah, again like the when, when when I did break my face in my last game, that was I had that feeling of relief. Um I remember the initial point when it happened coming off the dock looked at me and he goes yeah mate you've like you've got a like you've broken your face yeah. i go cool like it feels like i've got a hole in my face yeah we go in the change room and i remember i cried for 20 seconds and then i was sitting in my locker and i was just like sobbing i was making the sound but i actually didn't feel shit like and i remember going wait why am i crying i go everything that like I was battling with throughout the year, with whether it was footy related and falling out of the love with the game and that. Um, it's all like it felt like a relief knowing that it was done. Really, yeah. So, and I think at that point that made me really understand that footy wasn't going to be an option for me. And having that realization of it took an injury to break my face to realize, yeah, like relief. I'm I'm done. Was that so? That was the moment. So you thought that's it. That's it. No yeah. Footy. And I just and I remember my exit meeting. We went in and without getting into the full conversation on my exit meeting, we just sat down and they said, "How are you feeling?" And I just remember going, "Look, I, I'm done. Like I'm burnt out physically, mentally. I'm I'm out. Like where there was no contract talks. Um, I wasn't offered anything. Um, I remember just sitting there going, "Well." If there was one in front of me, I don't think I could sign it again. Right. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm completely burnt out. And um, I guess after an exit meeting, you leave and you got your P 
PDMs there. And I just sort of had this plan for them to say, hey, look, I've got um, so many things lined up. And that's when I had being mentors lined up. And I just explained to them, I'm doing this, this, this. I'm, I might play footy somewhere next year. Who knows? But I, I said probably not. And I just like just let them know that I was okay in the sense of I wanted to sh- tell them that don't don't call, don't check up on me. I'm just ready to park this part of my life and move on. Move on. And um, yeah, I guess that's when it like that's when it all kind of sort of I guess essentially hit me that there's more to football. I needed to find something else and being mentors and social support work was something that I, um, yeah, I loved. It was like you play in front of so many people and you impact people at a, in a grand, like in a, you get this adrenaline and this fulfillment and satisfaction from, from making a whole crowd roar. Mm. But I was getting similar tingles and similar feelings working one-on-one with a participant. And You've got the ability to make genuine impact on impact. a person's life. Yeah, and it was yeah. way more personal. And I guess the person that I was, um, that was something I thrived in and I loved seeing someone grow into yeah. a version of themselves. And it also made me feel like I was a role model. I had a bigger purpose than what was beyond me. And, mm. um, yeah, and I, I, I guess... I guess that sort of time and, and I, I speak on, on um, Reese Shaw and um, the one book he used to always send me, send me pages of it was, I um, don't know whether you've heard it, but I think it was called like The Horse, The Rabbit and The Boy or something like that. Yeah. It's like, it's it's honestly like a children's book, but it's just got so many incredible lessons in there. He used to send me a page of that once a week and um, yeah, I used to at times see it and go, oh, that's really cool and just sort of like reply back. But there was one vivid time when I received it and I just remembered bawling my eyes out. Yeah. And I was just like, I needed that. Like what? And I was like, I just – and over text you can't do much. It's like you re- re- reply back, oh, thank you, I needed that so much, blah, 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 blah. But he was someone who just got me mm-hmm. and – um yeah, I'm forever grateful that he was there during that time. That was within uh, an industry that I was falling out of love with. He was a big reason to why I probably just hung on till the end of the year. I just didn't want to truly, truly give up. I still was trying to find joy. I was still trying to find happiness in arguably your childhood dream. Um, so, yeah, I guess... I guess now, like pe- people, people look at me and they go, "Oh, you're so joyful, you're so happy." Like, and 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 that's sort of the observation people have of me now. But I find that the smile is brighter because of the dark times I've been in, and I'm able to blossom now, knowing what I've gone through, what I have been through, and there's a form of gratitude that. I'm I'm so thankful that I'm in the position I am because I know what the other sort of side looks like. Mm. Um, and again, there's no and I and I and I sort of want to make it quite clear like it wasn't the way I see the Suns and my experience there was like you, we probably all have that those two friends that we go oh she's outgoing she's great you're like the 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 boy version of her like and you try and meet two people together. Um, and they're two incredible people, but they just don't work. Yeah. I felt like that's just where we were, where. That's a beautiful way to sum that up, brother. Yeah. Like, cause I don't, I don't want people to think it's a negative, like it, I've, the people there are fantastic and I've the, some incredible relationship, relationships there. And I went and watched the, the VFL grand final cause they, they made it there and they won the week before we played. And, um, I actually loved catching up with all the the physios, all the – like just seeing familiar faces there and footy gets put aside. You start talking about life um, and that's more important to me than footy. And, um, yeah, the, they'll forever be my friends and um, I only speak of them highly. But at that time there were certain feelings and emotions that I had within that changed the person I was and I needed change at the time and the best way to do that was obviously – to leave football, well, that's how I thought that was going to be, um, or that I thought that was the only viable option. And but yeah, I've, I I just don't think we were a compatible match, and it's a shame. But I uh, again, 
those sort of times have allowed me to grow and to be the person I am today. And I guess the Magpie Army, congratulations. You've, <laughs> you've got the best version of me. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you didn't get to see me at my worst. But, um, yeah, again, the way they've welcomed me in their arms and allowed me to be different and um, have embraced me. And as much as, you know, all the boys at Collingwood and the staff members and, um, yeah, I'm I'm so, so lucky to – to be in the position I am, um, yeah, I'm just super grateful and thankful. Brother, thank you so much for sharing that. Mate, that is like, I imagine, obviously pretty tough to do, like, and for you to come on and speak about your experience so openly, like, mate, I feel like I'm tearing up just like listening to you speak and I'm so proud, like I'm so proud to call you a mate. Um, I'm so proud that you can actually come on a long form platform like this and have these conversations like mate, it's it's honestly truly incredible and I don't take this lightly like I'm so grateful for you jumping on and I think for you to be so open and to be so vulnerable I imagine it's going to allow so many other people to do the same yeah. like that's that's the whole reason why I want to have these conversations especially someone like you who not just your teammates and your friends and family look up to but a wider community in the AFL so mate thank like Thank you so much. I've got so much love and so much appreciation for you. Um, just before we f move on from that topic, what do you think made you fall back in love with the game? Because obviously I look at you who's got a lot of love for the game now. Obviously yeah, got, yeah, a, yeah. got just got, got, yeah, a, got, yeah. a, got a premiership with, with the Pies, which is which is very cool. It was you went up, you, you obviously had the, those moments at, at, at the Gold Coast and then you moved on to support work, which is a beautiful work saying like, mate, I've been there as well. I know what it's like. Having the ability to have genuine impact is truly beautiful, brother. Mm. Was there, what, what switch? Like what, what was the, what was the moment? Well, there might not be an exact moment. Um, was there a reason where you're like, nah, I'm not, I'm not done. I want to, I want to keep pushing. I want to, I want to do this again. Well, like I said before, sort of the, I, I completely gave up on myself. Yeah. Um, the the people that really helped me were, were obviously my partner and, and her dad. Like I, I struggled to call mum and dad because mum and dad had their own views on what I should have done at the time. And like dad being an individual athlete is he's what he was saying was true. I needed to change something that was going to get my body right. But it's hard to to do that in a team aspect to yeah. to try and stand out and do your own program. Like it was just, yeah. it was a bit, I guess in a sense, it's a bit foreign in a team sport. Um, so like calling mum and dad, it didn't get hostile, but it was always like, should do this. And it just got more, it, it built more, um, like it almost made it more obvious I should just give up yeah. because um, things weren't working out and we had a solution, but it just wasn't a viable solution. Um, but even when I did receive, I remember writing down a piece of paper and um, I remember writing, I'd only consider coming back to footy if it was Richmond or Collingwood. And really? The reason I did write that was because Richmond was an environment I did thrive on. I was my authentic self, had incredible relationships there and um, I for, will forever remember Richmond as a, a time when I grew f potentially from boy to man. Um, as an eight, 19 year old or whatever man looks like, but just growing up, mm. um, learning a lot of life lessons and maturing as, as a, as a young adult. Um, but also I just knew fly and what he was about as a person. Um, he was my VFL coach for so many years and he got the best out of everyone and having won a flag with him. And I remember when he got the job, I messaged him and just said, those boys are going to love you. Um, the same way I loved you and I still do love you. Um, and I just said, congratulations, I'll be watching from afar. And then in their first year, they started winning all these close games made to a prelim. And I remember just going, I watched, I never watched footy, but I watched one of the finals games when they were playing and it was just enjoyable to watch. Mm. I remember writing to him going, hey, I know the job's not done. You're playing some incredible football. Um, hope you're going well and, and your little one. And we sort of just always had a little bit of back and forth here and there. And he used to always reply and yeah. always full of emojis and love hearts to me. So it feels really <laughs> nice having um, a head coach reply in a, in a, such a loving way, the wet same way I reply to people. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to be a part of that environment if it was available. And I remember when I got the call 
Um, it was a Friday. We'll drive them down from from work. So I had a, um, a participant out in um, Coomera, which is about, you know, now with traffic and the way. It's a little bit worse than the go. Yeah. yeah isn't it? He called me at the start of that and I'd picked up. And, um, you know, when Becky calls, I pick up pretty quickly. When I saw Craig McRae call, I nearly beat, you know, beat yeah. that average time of picking up. <laughs> sorry, like, Becky. <laughs> sorry, Becky. But, yeah, I had to pick that up as quick as I could. Um, he um, he just said, look, wh- where are you at? And I just, it, like, stuck in traffic. I just exploded with how I was feeling where I was at. And I just said, look, I want to be honest with you because – that time I had a little bit of interest from other clubs, but the most that sort of happened was, hey, can we have your GPS? I sent in my GPS and I wouldn't hear back from them. So I was like, oh. Well, like your GPS data. data like your running yeah, data. My running data. Yeah. And, um, and, I'd, and I'd sent that to a few clubs. Um, obviously, they'd reached out to my manager and a little bit of interest, but it all just fizzled out. Mm-hmm. I think everyone, I was sort of, I was very bad with my phone at that time as well. I didn't want to, I just wanted to move on and, my manager probably didn't understand. I probably wasn't being as truthful as I could to him as well. Like, um, but when Fly called, I just remember telling him everything. And then at, at that time, I remember just exploding, going, "Wow, I've just said everything. I've treated him like a, a psych for the last forty-five minutes. I'm nearly home." And I was just expecting him to go, "Hey, mate, like, it just sounds like you're a bit broken. Like, well, we'll just pick a hungrier kid. Yeah. It just seems like you're defeated." And I'll never forget it. He just said, "Mate, it sounds like you need a little bit of love." He goes, I'm not going to promise you anything, but I love you as a person and I think your best is good enough to play on our side. Um, just consider this training spot. He goes, I'm not going to promise you anything, but there's one spot left and there's two of you. Um, and at that point I was like, whoa. Like, and I remember going, well, I really do appreciate it. And he goes, look, I'm not going to make you make a decision now. Give me a call back on on Monday. So this was Friday. On Monday he goes, um, call back, I'll be in Adelaide. And I was like, cool. And that afternoon I told Becky, I said, how cool is this, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do it. Mm. And I was very hesitant. And Becky's like, you, you you did say you wanted to be at one of these two clubs. You manifested it two months ago. You wrote that these exact clubs to have the interest of 18 clubs, to have those one of those clubs that you've written down want you to train on. Like, you just got to go. Yeah. And um, took me a while and – then I spoke to Becky's old man and he was just like, Becky, you'll go anywhere. Like just – like <laughs> it'll be a good opportunity for you. Like like I can't imagine you sitting at the age of 30 on, on your chair going, wish I did this, wish mm. I could have. Like that's a really regretful life to live. Just go do it. Um, and I just remember then Saturday morning waking up and I called Fly again. He, he didn't pick up. Um but he got back to me. He was busy with his family and that. And he, um, and I just said, hey, mate, look, I don't need to, to to wait till Monday. Like, I'm coming. And he goes, right, can you be here in a week's time? I go, I haven't trained. I go, I don't want to get there and hurt myself, whatever. He goes, all right, I'll see if I can push it back. I'll, I'll let you know tomorrow, but um, hopefully just after Christmas. So they were able to push it all the way back to the 11th of Jan where I started training and um, – yeah, I guess that was sort of the start of the the rekindling phase where I got back into smelling the deep heat in the change rooms, yeah. seeing the camaraderie of the boys. I had fresh faces that – and, again, the, the the crazy thing about power of change or, like, going into a fresh environment and people only have a perceived image of you, but you can walk in and be – any person from scratch yeah. and no one is going to have like past judgment on you or say you've changed or like, it's just no one knew me. Yeah. So we're going to this environment and go, all right, persona, you're off. Yeah. I'm just going to go in as, as hard as I can. And the day I go in day one will be the same person that will leave when I retire. Like, let's just go in there and be myself. I've got goosebumps, bro. Oh, That's, yeah. Mate, what a story. Yeah. Far so out. I, I guess even that point, like then there was obviously a hiccup there where I didn't get picked up and they went with the younger boy, Oscar, who I would have as well. He's a 19-year-old giant who's um, who's a fantastic character. He, he'll, he'll be a superstar in the future for us. And 
Um, I guess that chat as well. I remember when Fly sort of said, look, mate, we're, we're going with Oscar. So, oh, really? Oh. Yeah, so there wasn't a spot there for me. <laughs> oh, I did not. I thought, yeah. you, I thought you got the spot. No, nah, no. Nah. Yeah. So um, so they picked they they picked him and I had the chat. And the type of person Fly is, he knew the type of person I was. So he um, he knew to, to, to help with the wounds. He brought in his little one, Charlie, who uh, I knew – playing when, when we were at VFL. She was tiny when I left for the Gold Coast and get back and she's older, she talks yeah, and yeah. It, it was pretty cool and I've got a little soft spot for like little humans and yeah, they just yeah, they're yeah. Like make my heart melt. Um, so he told me the news and I just remember going, all right, like, let me just recoup all this. Charlie and I colouring in between the lines. Of playing, Of course you are. <laughs> playing Pac-Man. <laughs> Fly's got this little arcade game in his office. So we played a few games of that and I just yeah. remember going, all right, let me just – Sort all this out. I go, I'm, I'm like, I'm really flat internally, but at the same time, I was filled with so much joy. And I remember telling Fly, I go, Fly, like, just thank you, thank you, not 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 for not for sacking me, <laughs> but just thank you for rekindling my joy in sport and football. Thank you for showing me that there is an environment that is tailored to me. Thank you for showing me that I'm allowed to love the game again, and there is love, happiness, and joy in AFL because I was oblivious to it. I, I lost that. Yeah. I lost that fulfillment, lost that love, lost that joy. And I just, I was so grateful. And it gave me closure knowing that I still wanted to be a footballer and I knew my best was good enough. And and that's the whole saga. So I went for one training session at a rival club. Yeah. The biggest rival was Carlton. Carlton, yeah. Yes. So, oh, yes. So, it so, so that was back. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, was that yeah. little journey. So I went there for a day, and um, I got a missed call from my manager halfway through training, and I thought oh, I'm not gonna call when I'm in the four walls to my manager. So I fi- finished the meetings, did weights, did everything. Then three o'clock hits, and I leave and um, sit in the car, and my manager goes, "In the perfect world, where would you want to be?" And I go, "Please put me in like in like in Colin. Like I just." Part of their furniture. I've yeah. been there for the last two weeks. I yeah. just felt at home. Want to be playing for Fly. Yeah. And um, he goes, right. Well, I think something's just occurred. Have you got all your gear? I go, I left my boots. He goes, right. Go back to Carlton. Go grab your boots because I don't think you'll be there tomorrow. And I was just like, all right. Called my my mate. Said I need to go out for dinner. So me, Cal Moore, and my partner went out to Korean barbecue. It was beautiful. Really? And I just remember giving my phone to sort of Becky and said, Becky, just when it calls, just, I don't want to see messages, just like when it calls, let me know what's happened. And then eight o'clock, you're signed, congratulations, you're a Collingwood player for 2023. And that's where it all just like, I was over the moon. Wow, wow. bro, yeah. how good. It's pretty cool. Mate, it's so special. Yeah. So yeah. special. And that that's the conversation, like I said before, it's like, it's the last 10 years of work. It's all, it's, it's the resilience, it's the struggles that you've gone through, it's it's everything to that moment. You get the call, you go through the year, you get the grand final win, mate. Like, like I said, mate, I'm so bloody proud of you. Like it's it's honestly so lovely to see you thrive. And I don't think there's a fucking person more deserving than no, you, brother. No, so I'm sure there's a lot of people that I don't are think so, mate. But... Um mate, I don't think so. Um before we wrap things up, I yep. do I do want to touch on Movember. Yep. Um, yeah, I feel yeah. I feel like we have to. I was going to leave with it with a beautiful moustache, mate. Yeah, I'm trying <laughs> you, to grow something out. You've got the beautiful moustache. <laughs> the handlebars. You, mate, you grew yours forever, yeah? First time yeah. shaved um, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, well, I um, ever since I was a kid, I've always I've always had one. But in my first few games of footy, I had a little thin one. Yes. That, that pre-season, I got rid of it. F- freshly into a AFL um, industry 2016 I shaved it when I was at Richmond and um yeah my first year was it was very faint yeah. um then after that I sort of had it until um Gold Coast uh, after my first year there I, I I got rid of it Becky then was my partner she hated it she goes <laughs> like I've never known you without it so <laughs> she's giggling in the background yeah she um she's she used to say oh, I feels like I'm kissing a different man and I was like <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean a different man? How do you know what that feels like? <laughs> but no, I, um, yeah, at, like I got rid of it. It, it felt really bare and naked. Mm. I, I felt like it was a bit of my own identity. And in a sense, um, I guess the year that I've gone through and I always talk about, well, now I talk about that persona, Taylor Mask. I felt like that was a bit of my persona. Yeah, I yeah, was yeah. always trying to hide behind this moustache that made me look 
authentic or different and it made me feel a bit more welcoming. But at times, like, it curled up and it seemed like I was always smiling. But there, there were times when I probably wasn't smiling. There were times when I was pretty pretty miserable and it was – it was almost a, a nice parting of, of ways of hard times, good times. Um, I'm always been there through my whole journey in the mirror when when it's seen me upset or when I've stared deeply trying to do stupid things. Like uh-huh. the, the, I tried all sorts of things like to, to try and fix what I, I used to train on an empty stomach before coffee. I used to go and do like a 10K session um, and not fuel myself because I wanted to f- feel and understand what like – feeling hungry meant and like I yeah, don't I, like, I, I have read it or heard it somewhere and I tried it for about three weeks and all I did was hallucinate I probably went backwards to be honest yeah. like I, I tried every I was desperate at that time and my mind was there through that whole journey if anything my mind was like come on I need food like mm. um so to part ways with it it was it feels weird. Um, it definitely does. But at the same time, like I'm starting a lot of conversations, whether they were good or bad. Like I had a lot of people go, why would you do that? Like it's magical. It's, yeah. you know, it's got us that result. Like, yeah. but you can never think like yeah. that. And um, the best part is I, I've I've been able to, to, to once sit on a platform like this that I'm super grateful for and tell my story. And it gives me a, that addictive feeling of relief. Like, because mm. I've had a lot of people reach out and ask about me and, so many people um, see the story that gets put in the papers or see the story, um, you know, I guess from a football perspective, but within behind the scenes and stuff, there's a lot that has gone on and um, and things that are so relatable. Like everyone is probably going through very similar things. And, um, yeah, I, I guess Movember to me is just the awareness and um, understanding that, it's okay to feel a certain way. Um, it's 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 okay to have conversations. Um, the best, one of the best bit, bits of advice I had was once I felt really ashamed and guilty for crying. I cried at work, and um, and I remember just um, sitting in a room, and I just remember going, I'm, "I don't want to see anyone. I just want to just let everyone pass, and I'm just going to go home, just get in my car and drive." I just got like, cried in 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 a, in a room in an office, and I felt ashamed and embarrassed, and feel like people try to potentially help that day and um, they try to talk to me. And I said, I don't want to borrow it. I'm just going to leave. I just felt embarrassed. Mm. Um, and the best bit of advice I got after that was if you were to see a friend like that, how would you react? Like would you would you, um, would you, you speak rudely about them? Would you, you know, go behind their back and say, oh, so-and-so? Like my, my nature, I'd be like, oh, I'd help him. Mm. Like I'd, I'd want to sit down. I'd want him to be okay. It's like, well – why didn't I think that through to myself? Yeah. So at times putting yourself in third person and understanding that things might not be okay, but it's it's like your friends are there for a reason, your mates are there for a reason, um, and your best ones will stay with you. They'll help you through things and and you'll get you'll get a whole heap of holiness between each other and yeah, you get to that point where you just stare at each other and, and tear up like the old lay old lay yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, th- I think it, it plays a special part in my heart knowing that um, where I once was and, and where I am today um, to overcome things that, that arguably to me were a big deal. And I know we should never compare hardships and that and people go through a lot in their, in their mm-hmm. life. And um, But to go through something that, affected me a fair bit and to get through the other end, I'm, um, yeah, I'm super grateful. And, and to know that I had, it wasn't just me that did it. It was, it was my team. It was whoever was, whoever was in my corner and, yeah. um, yeah, just finding those people that, that help you be the best version of you and allow you to be you. Super important. And I've found that people who are probably more aligned to being advocates for the mental health space have usually gone through past struggle themselves or they've seen friends and family who've gone through past struggles. So that's why they want to be an advocate. Um, mm. Mate, there's so many mental health organisations. Why Why Movember? Was it purely the moustache or was there was there something else? No, I, I, yeah, I, I think it was a little bit of the moustache. And, I mean, it, it was probably um, a, a sort of a BHAG, so like a big, hairy, obnoxious goal. Um, it was like <laughs> – I say that again? A I BHAG? Think, yeah, I think <laughs> – 
big hairy. I think I think I've heard that somewhere. It's like you, you need a, a b hag. It might have been something we did at Richmond, maybe a long, long time ago. My first year b hag. So big, obnoxious, and hairy goal. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. um, and yeah, like I I just I've always had this thing of like it's to to part ways with something that's been me, mm-hmm. um, and people identify me as that and. I feel like if I was to to donate or to to do um, a talk or something like it wouldn't have as much traction as if I was to do something potentially a bit controversial yeah. um, in a healthy manner and it was something I was pretty keen to to do and change is always something that um, and obviously this year with the amount of change I went through interstate new club and that can be very daunting mm. but at the same time it can be super exciting yeah. and I feel like that's my outlook on. Um, footy games now and the fear and, and you know, the daunt and the, yeah, essentially the change, uh, it turns into excitement. Yeah. Um, so I was actually a little bit excited to see how I'd look Yeah. because um, I haven't seen myself for two years, my baby face. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah, I just I just felt like they were an incredible platform that uh, they reached out to me as well And because I said in passing in one of the interviews that I'd consider – parting ways with it if mm. I was to donate a little like to have a bit of a donation attached to it and yeah. play my part in 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 this sort of system and um yeah they reached out to me and said hey look we can organize something we yeah. can get a barber we great, can do great, some great. some footage and and that and I was like perfect like well this episode will go live on the last day perfect. of November um so is there a where where can we donate is there is um there- it's so there, there'll be a link on my bio um I will be, I'll probably look a little bit different to this yes. by then. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll yeah. be maybe a bit more respectable. But, um, yeah, essentially there is a link on my bio. I'll probably share some things on my story. Um, but it doesn't have to be me either. Like if you've got friends and family that are, you know, doing the cause, you you see another athlete on on there that you, that you love, um, donate to them as well. Like yeah. it doesn't just have to be to me. Yeah. Find find someone that you enjoy, yeah. you can relate to, um, help them, support yeah. support people that are close to you. Mate, I love that. Um, brother, we got we to gotta wrap it sure, up. Yeah, we're yeah, we're, 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 we're chewing the fat. I think we're an hour and a half. <laughs> um, yeah, um, mate, before um, before we finish up, is there anything that else that you'd like to speak about before we finish it up? No, no, we, we definitely touched bases on, on sort of everything that I'd – but like I said before, I've, I've got this incredible feeling of relief and fulfillment and um, also I just want to say thank you for giving me a platform. Like I've been um, pretty lucky where people do want to talk about my story and that and um, it's a unique one in itself but also I wanted to say it the right way and um, I knew there was no one better than having a friend like yourself who can – um, chew the fat with, and um, I'm, I'm very, very appreciative that you give me a platform where I can reach out to so many people and hopefully make change in a in a positive manner. And um, yeah, again, just just thank you for thank you for letting me express my story through my eyes. Um, yeah, and and allowed me to to feel very safe and and allow me to open up in in this environment here. So thank you, mate. I I appreciate that, and and just on that. Like I've had conversations with a lot of really cool people, like Olympians, gold medalists, like close friends in the NRL space, AFL space. And man, I think this has to be one of my favorite conversations out, out of all of Thank them. You. And um, for I, now, for now, <laughs> no, I don't know, man. Like I, I love these conversations because most like all the people have come on are, are mates, to, yeah. to be honest. And, and I'm very proud to call you a friend, a, go- a good friend. And, and I'm so bloody grateful for you not only just to come on and and share your story and your experiences and be open and be vulnerable, but also just to be a good friend. Like I think you're a really good person and I think anyone that talks about you, like I think if someone, like the way someone talks behind your back, it's it's so lovely to hear. Then And I've said it in this podcast before, it's just like no one deserves the success as much as Leggy because you have so much love for your friends and your family and, and your fully your true authentic self. So mate, I've got a lot of love for you. Um, thank you again for coming on. Um, I'm so excited for what the next couple of years look like for you. I'm excited for, um, I'm excited to have a dinner next week. I'm excited to settle yeah. in, in Melbourne for a little bit. So cool. brother, thank you. I've got a lot of love. So I appreciate you, brother. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Come here. You're the best, bro. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Right, come here. Love you, brother. Love you, brother. Thanks, bro.